All right. Well, thank you for joining us for Chicago Scavenger Hunt. Uh, we welcome back Jessica Munarik. Uh, she is the author of uh, Chicago Scavenger and Secret Chicago, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure. Her writing and photography covering culture and travel have appeared in GQ, The Architect's Newspaper, Chicago Magazine, and many more. Um, and join us in the library on July 7th at 2.30 p.m. We're going to have a really fun program, Summertime Entertaining with Chef Maddox. If you're not already registered, you want to register, trust me. Um, during which Susan will provide a, a live cooking demonstration and celebrate summertime entertaining with friends and family. So we will have samples as well. So we will have fun. Um, if you're at home, you can put, you can, this is interactive. So mm -hmm. you're going to be putting um, some things in the chat when Jessica prompts you to. Um, if you are here in the room, if you could silence your phones, that would be great. And feel free to chime in if you have answers to Jessica's questions. And that's it. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for joining and for all of you joining us virtually. And thanks to Jamie and the Deer Hill Library for having me back. Um, I was able to do a few programs during the pandemic in 2020, but those were virtual. Um, we had two because the, the crowd was so enthusiastic at the first one that we had to book a second one, which was amazing. I think that was a first for me. So um, very happy to be back to your field library. Um, and yeah, it's, as Jamie said, spring, summer is here. So it's the perfect time to get out and explore and um, see what's going on in our own backyards. So uh, we'll have lots of riddles to solve tonight. And I, as Jamie said, I like to keep things interactive. So it'll be a group effort to solve the riddles. And um, I'm gonna start off by answering some frequently asked questions about how I wrote the book. And then we'll get into uh, the scavenger hunt across Chicago. Um, and of course, have some time at the end for all of you to share your favorite hidden gems of the region. So hopefully no matter how long you've lived in the area, you'll learn something new tonight or get inspired to go um, seek out a new place. All right, so I'll just start off with a little bit about me. I'm not from Chicago originally. Hello, welcome. Um, I grew up in Cleveland and I did start planning scavenger hunts in my grandma's backyard when I was a kid making treasure maps and things. So I think that's how I got started in scavenger hunts. Um, but I've lived in Chicago for about 13 years. And when I moved here, I was so excited to be in a dynamic city and um, I would go on you know, bike rides and jogs and just get curious about the different things I saw around me. And I would do some research on them. And I started blogging about these things um, on my own and writing for different publications around town. So eventually, you know, I had enough places to fill a book. Um, so you can say that I've been writing since I moved to Chicago um, for this book, but it, the process really took me about a year. Uh, so this is my first book, Secret Chicago, that came out in 2018. That was the program that I was doing for Deerfield last time, if you joined that. And it's 90 places in and around Chicago that are a little bit offbeat. I used to say that it was a scavenger hunt to uh, an unusual side of the city, but then I wrote scaven an actual scavenger hunt book. Um, and both of them I, I wrote for Chicagoans and visitors alike. So there may be some things if you've lived here a long time that you that are familiar to you, but hopefully there's something new and interesting. So the Scavenger Hunt book covers 17 different neighborhoods. You can think of it as 17 neighborhood tours. Um, and here are the locations. I tried to do a good combination of, you know, north, south, and west sides, um, even all the way down to Pullman there on the bottom. And um, we're going to visit one spot from each of these neighborhoods tonight on our scavenger hunt. And my goal was really to get people curious about the city and its people, just to maybe pique their interest to go visit somewhere new to you, whether that's a neighborhood across town that you've never explored or just something you know nearby that you've always been curious about. Um, so how did I get this idea? Well, I was talking to my publisher about a year into the pandemic, 
And we were trying to come up with ways to get people to engage in the city again safely. So on this scavenger hunt, um, all the riddles that you'll solve are things that are located outside. So the idea is you can go visit all of these places and you don't you know, get social distance. You don't need to go indoors. Um, some of them are businesses and things that you can go inside if you'd like. But um, that was the idea to make everything outdoors so it could be safe. Um, and for me, it was just really great way to re-engage after being pulled up in my apartment for a year um, and, you know, riding my bike across town again and remembering all the different neighborhoods and why I love living here. So that was uh, a very nice re-emergence for me. So there are 342 riddles in this book, <laughs> lots of places to choose. Um, and in those 17 neighborhoods, I really picked places that had many interesting sites close together so that you can uh, drive or walk or bike them in like an afternoon or a day. So the idea is, you know, it should take you a few hours or a day or whatever to solve one neighborhood's worth of riddles. Um, and the places that I chose were either historically important um, or, you know, visually interesting or just important to the culture of the neighborhood. Um, so I did a lot of reading, thank you libraries for, to get these ideas. Um, but also just going and visiting the neighborhoods myself and asking the people who live there, you know, what are the, the hidden gems or the, you know, businesses who've been here forever that are really significant to the neighborhood. So these are places like little known museums, public art that you might see uh, because it was pandemic finding new nature areas was a big deal to me. I was getting a little tired of the same park by my house over and over again. So finding new little nature spots was really nice. Uh, lots of architecture because this is Chicagoland after all. And, um, you know, cafes, restaurants, things like that. So here's a sample of what it looks like. Um, every clue has a riddle that's in rhyme. I've never written in rhyme before. I don't, I've, I've never considered myself a poet before. So that was an interesting challenge. Uh, I felt a little bit like Dr. Seuss after a while, started thinking in rhyme, but it was a lot of fun. It was a fun way to write these. Um, and then there's also a photo clue and then uh, another like photograph or, um, you know, graphic that is also a little photo hint. So the idea is, um, when you go to, when you discover the place, you'll go and you know, see what's in the photo. It's the kind of zoomed in version of it and you'll know that you found it. Um, and the book is spiral bound. So it's really meant to be taken out and used whether you're you know, challenging your family or your friends or you just keep it in your car for when you wanna go do a solo adventure. Um, when you have people visiting you from out of town, you can kind of just send them off with it and say, here you go, entertain yourself for a few hours. Um, if you're, you know, going on a, a food crawl around town. So lots of fun ways to use it. So without further ado, let's get into the riddles. So as Jamie said, uh, this is interactive. So I would love for you to shout out if you're in the room, if you think you know the answer, and then uh, feel free to, to chime in via the chat if you are joining us virtually. We're going to start off in the near north side. It's a picturesque area just north of the loop with neighborhoods like Old Town, Streeterville, River North, and the Gold Coast. Lots of great dining, shopping, and historic architecture. So there's your photo clue, and here's our very first riddle. Four Old Town faces cast in stone came from a German theater, displayed where comedy is shown, discover the next big star here. Second. Yes, I've heard a few, few folks. Don't be shy. You can, you can shout it out. A few folks in the room got Second City. And so did Elaine online. <laughs> so did you recognize the faces? No. Right, you're, you're normally just going in to see the show, right? So next time you go um, with your family or friends, you can stop stop them and impress them with your knowledge of the architecture of the building. But of course, Second City is the legendary improv comedy uh, group that found, was founded at U Chicago in the 1950s. And its alumni include Harold Ramis, Chris Farley, Tina Fey, Bill Murray, lots of very funny, funny folks. Um, but there's another piece of Chicago history here, and that's this frieze that's salvaged from the Schiller Theater, which was a German theater 
um, that was in the loop. And then it was torn down in the 1970s, I believe. So when that building was torn down, they, they saved this fragment of the building and put it up in front of the second city here, you can see. And so the faces of the folks up here are German um, musicians, philosophers. I don't know exactly who is who. If there's any scholars in the room who might know, let's shout it out. Um, but it's, it's nice to see it. An old part of Chicago's architecture that was lost, uh, kind of be preserved in some form here. So next time you're going in, you can uh, stop and admire it. All right, we're going to the South side next to Hyde Park. And Hyde Park started out as its own independent town before it was annexed by the city of Chicago. Of course, it's known for being the home of the University of Chicago, as well as hosting the 1893 World's Fair um, and home to the Obamas when they're in Chicago as well. Here's our riddle. Next to a garden gifted from Japan, on the wooded island the sculpture stands, you'll see lotus petals reaching up tall, a message of peace and harmony for all. I just discovered this. Wonderful. It's, it's behind. Japanese garden. Japanese garden. What are your names? What are your names? Larry and Lori. Larry and Lori. Well, thank you for coming and for shouting that out. So the name of the sculpture is the Sky Landing. It is located behind the Museum of Science and Industry um, next to the Japanese Garden. And as you can see here, it's uh, a dozen lotus, lotus petals that are 12 feet tall each. And it's the first permanent artwork um, in the Americas by Yoko Ono. So she was born in Japan. And this is a symbolic location because um, this is next to the Garden of the Phoenix, which was a garden from the 1893 World's Fair that after the fair ended, Japan gifted the garden to the people of Chicago as a sign of friendship. Um, so this is why Yoko Ono wanted to build uh, near this site to you know, promote healing and harmony between US and Japan and people all over the world, really. So Sky Landing, the sculpture has its own website and you can go on and write a message of peace and you can see messages of peace from people all over the world. It's kind of nice. Did you enjoy the sculpture while you were visiting? Yeah, it's kind of a rolling hill area right there. And so you can see this um, from different angles. It looks different, it's kind of neat to wander through. Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, so heading up to the north side to Andersonville, which is an inviting neighborhood with proud Swedish roots, lots of small businesses, and a LGBTQ community. Here's our riddle. This is a newer, newer spot. Look for misdirection along Clark Street. Just finding the entrance is a feat. Go in, but leave your detergent behind and prepare for these wizards to blow your mind. Oh, did I stump everyone? This is the Chicago Magic Lounge. So I just went here um, Memorial Day weekend. I had some friends visiting and it was such a blast. Highly recommend it. Um, so it doesn't really look like this door is that interesting, but you see the word misdirection is up at the top on the ceiling there. And all these magic posters, um, even when you go inside, it looks like you're in a laundromat, still not that interesting, but then there's a hidden door behind one of the old vintage washing machines and you go into magic show. So they specialize here in Chicago style magic. And what that means is it's very, they come to your table, um, or they'll do it right at the bar. If you're at the bar and it's very, um, quick and intimate, like they're, you know, right here, they're not super far away on the stage. And there's an element of comedy to it as well. They don't you know, take themselves too seriously, which I think is probably good with a magic show. So uh, I highly recommend it. I went and I had a fabulous time. Um, cocktails are very delicious as well. All right, going to head to the near west side. So this is just west of the loop, um, including neighborhoods like Greektown, Little Italy, and the West Loop. So these days, there's a lot of trendy restaurants and things in this area, but you can still find some of the traditional businesses and restaurants. The only address you'll find on this street is where trainees learn to beat the heat, 
The Great Fire's origin is marked by a brown flame. Mrs. O'Leary's cow took the blame. Elaine got it. And Marilyn, it is the Chicago Fire Academy. So this is the site where the O'Leary, where the Great Chicago Fire started, where the O'Leary's property was. Um, although Mrs. O'Leary and her cow were formally exonerated by the mayor eventually. The site where their property was, where the fire started, is now the home of the Chicago Fire Academy. This is very Chicago, I feel, to mark the site with uh, the training school for the fire, fire folks. And this bronze sculpture is called Pillar of Fire, and that commemorates um, the location of the fire. So behind it, you'll see there's a wall of retirees, uh, former firefighters, and then in the entrance to the building, there's a little tiny fire museum of just some vintage memorabilia and equipment. And I really enjoy little tiny museums like that. So if you're if that, if that interests you, then I would check that out as well. It's located on DeCoven Street, and it's the only address on that street. Now, I've heard that they're trying to build a, a newer, more modern academy um, elsewhere, but I really love the fact that it's on the site of the fire. So hopefully they still do something with this space. All right, heading to Bronzeville next. Uh, it was nicknamed the Black Metropolis because it was the historic uh, and cultural center of African-American life in Chicago in the early 20th century. Uh, lots of folks moved up from the South during the Great Migration and settled around Bronzeville, um, including lots of very iconic folks like the Marx Brothers, Ida B. Wells, and Louis Armstrong. So it's packed with history. This was maybe my favorite neighborhood to learn more about when I was researching this book because there's just incredible history here. And here's our riddle. The nation's first museum of black art. It was created by the WPA, a space where that has black culture at its heart. It is still hosting exhibitions today. Has anyone been here? Not the DuSable, good guess. Not too far from the DuSable. So this is called the Southside Community Art Center. So the DuSable is the oldest, let me try to get this, um, this, this right, the oldest museum of black history. And this was the first museum of black art. So two superlatives um, in Chicago here that we have that are you know, not too far away from each other. And so this museum was opened uh, in, the in 1940 as part of a Works Progress Administration project. And as I said, it's the first Black art museum in the United States, and it's still operating today. It's fantastic. Um, you know, another smaller collection. They have rotating exhibits as well, so always fun to pop in here. And their mission is to preserve and promote um, Black artists and their work. Still doing it today. Can I ask a question? Of course. Was the building built as a museum or was it a house? I think of that it was a house, um, especially because it was opened in 1940. And this, I would say this building looks older than that. So that would be my guess. Good question. All right. I have a feeling a few of you might recognize this place. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Susan's got it already. All right, well, we'll talk about Logan Square. <laughs> it's a community area located along Chicago's iconic boulevard system. So it's a trendy area with lots of um, bars and nightlife and restaurants, but also, you know, beautiful old gray stones. So it's a, a very fun neighborhood to visit, especially when the weather's nice like this. You can, you know, wander and admire the architecture and then go grab a dinner somewhere. And you can grab dessert. Oh, Elaine's got it. Hold on, who else? Got a few folks chiming in, Marilyn as well. Part ice cream parlor and part candy store. It's famous for welcoming England's Fab Four down Western Ave. It's neon lights the way. Order a split or atomic sundae. And as everyone has guessed, it is Margie's Candies. Can I share a little story? Please, please candies? do, yes. Do you know Dove Candy? Well, the mm -hmm. he um, had his children running. He had an ice cream and can ice cream bar and candy store, 
on the south side of Chicago. And his kids were running after the, uh, what's the truck that ran around? Ice cream truck? But him, oh. but him, he was abhorred about it. So he created the duck bar. Oh, uh -huh. I didn't know that. Marilyn says he's the best monster banana splits ever. <laughs> Who has been to Margie's? Anyone? Anyone? What do you order there? I haven't been there since I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so probably the Sunday. Uh, I go for the Sunday. I haven't actually had the candy. They make, they, it's an ice cream parlor and they make their own candy there. And it's been around since 1921. So they've been in the same family for over a hundred years, which is amazing. Gertie's, which was in Brighton Park. okay. They still are associated. I think they still have a like connection with Lindy's Chili. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was at McKinley Park now. Mm -hmm. so I'm getting hungry. I'm ready to go on a food tour this summer of all across Chicago. Um, well, so I mentioned the Fab Four. They did, they played a sh concert in Chicago in 1965 and they did come here and have a Sunday after their show. So when you go inside Margie's, there's a lot of nostalgic memorabilia in aligning all the walls, but especially a lot of Beatles memorabilia. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I was here most recently last fall. I took my husband on his birthday for a Sunday. Oh. <laughs> it was cute. <laughs> And Marilyn is, yes, there is, they have a sister store on Ravenswood as well. There's more than one location. This is the only one that I've been to. I'm sure they're equally delicious. All right, we're going to go all the way up to the northernmost community area in Chicago, Rogers Park. It's one of the most diverse neighborhoods in Chicago with lots of international dining and shopping. Um, great local art scene. Um, when you're in Rogers Park, like, there's a, a park bench or seawall, I guess you call it, along the lake where every, and I think it might be this weekend or last weekend, they have um, artists come and paint it every year. And then even on the CTA embankments, there's murals and things. So there's just kind of art everywhere. I love it. As you see in this photo, it's also got great access to the lake and beaches. Here's our riddle. Near the lighthouse, take a stroll, wander down to the sandy knoll, native landscape being restored, Admire the shorebirds and the forbs. What are forbs. They are grasses. And that is a word that I learned when I was rhyming and writing this book. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I did not know that word before. Any guesses? Oh, I think this is really cool, especially to visit in the summer. Loyola Dune. Chicago has a dune habitat in the city limits. Fantastic. So it's at the south end of Loyola Beach. And this was just a part of the beach that kind of was less used. And so some of the grasses started growing up and the community thought, hey, let's let it grow. Let's see what happens. Um, so now it's been growing for a little while and it is a protected area. So you can't go walking through it, but you can go and see, um, you know, migrating birds come through and they nest there and you see the native plants that are growing. Um, and there is a lot of benefit to, to the city and to the shoreline. It, um, having that vegetation helps stabilize the shoreline and prevent erosion and things like that. So very cool that we have in our city limits dune habitat, I think. I didn't know about this until I was researching the book myself. Even though I've been to the beaches over there, I guess I never wandered down to that end of it. All right. Bridgeport, famous for baseball and bungalows. I just uh, rode my bike all the way to a Sox game the other day and they won. So that was <laughs> unusual for the season. Um, it's got a growing art scene and restaurant scene and is, of course, home of the Chicago White Sox. Here's our clue. The city was built where two watersheds meet. This maritime story is vital and offbeat. Aquatic history from fur traders to canoes and steamships, tugboats, and freighters. Has anyone been here? No. Uh, it's not far. I mentioned I like little museums. I like all kinds. 
This is the Maritime Museum. We have a Chicago Maritime Museum that explores Chicago's close relationship with water. I mean, it's why our city is where it's located. It's because of our access to the water. And so this talks about Chicago as a maritime city, which doesn't always, you know, not always the first thing that comes to mind, but it's super important to the history of the region. And they do that using model ships and maps and artifacts, and books, um, old photos, all kinds of fun things like that. The Irish came over to build the, the canal. Place. That's why it's called Bridgeport. Perfect. Um, and this is in the Bridgeport Arts Center, which used to be the Spiegel building, if anyone's familiar with that. So in this giant building, there's um, a lot of different spaces. There's uh, event venues and art spaces. Sometimes you'll go to a concert in there or an art show, something like that. But this museum is located inside, and it's a very fitting location for the Maritime Museum because it is on the bank of an infamous body of water called Bubbly Creek. If anyone has heard of Bubbly Creek. Um, this was when the Union stockyards were still going. Uh, they would dump some of the waste material into the river. And because that was organic material, it would break down and the carbon in that material will cause the water to bubble. And it still does, even though uh, the stockyards have been closed since what, the 70s. Um, still bubbling a little bit. I know they're working to clean, up, clean it up, but uh, maybe not Chicago's brightest moment in maritime history, but fitting that this uh, museum is located right there. All right, heading to Uptown, which was an entertainment powerhouse in the 1920s, still has a lot of great concert venues, um, theater venues, historic architecture, and international food. Here's our griddle, built to resemble a castle in Spain. A giant neon marquee spells out its name. It hosted roller skating and ballroom dance and catch a rock concert if you have the chance. Aragon Ballroom, that's correct. Elaine got it as too. So has anyone visited the Aragon? <laughs> Marilyn's been there. No rock and roll fans. I've been to a couple of shows here. <laughs> Marilyn's been to some rock concerts here. Which ones, Marilyn? So I was surprised. Oh, Slayer. Okay. Very rock and roll. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I was surprised to learn, because I, like I said, I've been to concerts, all the different ways the building has been used over the years. So um, sometimes I'll do a program and, and folks have been used to go ballroom dancing there or um, in the seventies, more of like a roller skating slash disco scene. Someone said they've seen wrestling tournaments in here. So it's kind of an interesting space, um, but it's great to admire by day or night. So um, it, as I said, it's built to resemble a Spanish village. So inside there's kind of along the perimeter um, turrets and balconies and things to look like a village. And the, the um, ceiling has a constellation sky. So very, very cool for those rock concerts in the seventies. Um, and then outside you can see all the Moorish architecture details. So I did, I never really stopped and looked at them until I was taking the photos, but look at all this brickwork and the color and the detail, of the terracotta, it's really lovely. So whether or not you are going in, you can still admire the building. Um, and Marilyn says, uh, her husband says they used to call it the Aragon Brawl Room in the 80s and 90s. So <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense if you're seeing Slayer and maybe watching some of those wrestling tournaments. <laughs> all right, the Loop. So we all know that the Loop is Chicago's downtown. Does anyone know how it got its name? Yeah. The, the elevated train tracks, yes. And it's kind of amazing when you think about the loop that it started out with just a few buildings down by the river and how many historic moments it's seen since those days. Um, of course, we have our lakefront parks, theater district there, um, iconic architecture. So there's a lot, a lot going on in the loop. Here's our riddle. East of the lions, find a portal to the past, a remnant from a building that didn't last. Salvaging the space, sadly, one man died. Now its training room is preserved inside. Yeah, at the Art Institute, they have the, from the Board of Trade. That's correct, yes. 
So it's the stock exchange arch. So uh, this fragment that you see now zoomed out, like here was the zoomed in detail. And then there it is zoomed out. It's behind the Art Institute. And it was from the Chicago Stock Exchange building, which was built in 1894 by the famous architecture duo of Adler and Sullivan. Unfortunately, it was lost in the 1970s when it was slated for demolition. Chicago was losing many historic buildings around that time. I mentioned the Schiller Theater earlier. Um, and so preservationists were really fighting to try to save these buildings and they didn't always succeed, but at least, you know, the loss of some of these buildings really galvanized people to try to do some more preservation. And uh, one of those folks was Richard Nickel. He was a photographer and he helped document and salvage a lot of these architectural treasures around the city. Um, he spent months documenting this site. Unfortunately, he died in an accident there, tragically at the site. So he never got to see it reconstructed. But the Art Institute did salvage um, this arch as well as the stock exchange training room, which you see in this image here. So they had everything restored. Um, and you can go and st stand in this room that is preserved the way that it was when the building was intact. And enjoy it. Uh, usually, has anyone been in here? Mm -hmm. This room? Yeah, There's nobody in there. Special. Sometimes there's special events in there, but if I'm just visiting the museum, uh, usually there's no one around and there's a set of doors. You have to go down a couple of stairs and the doors are not locked, but I don't think people know that you can go in. And so usually it's like you're in this super busy museum and then you have like a quiet moment. So I always enjoy it. And um, you can admire all of the, the stained glass and the all the stenciling that you see that's been restored. So thanks to people like Richard Nickel who um, save spaces like this for us to enjoy. It's one of my favorites in the city. I went to a great exhibition last year um, at Wrightwood, it's called 759, so it's Museum in Lincoln Park. And they have all kinds of exhibits, but they had a Richard Nickel um, exhibit and one about Louis Sullivan buildings that had been lost and they had his notebooks of him documenting some of these historic buildings. And it was amazing to see the level of detail of, um, you know, where, where he was talking about and the color that was used and just uh, measurements and details, like notebooks full, um, pretty amazing. So very happy that we can still enjoy some of these places. All right, heading to Pilsen, which is a neighborhood that got its name from the Czech community who settled there. Uh, but since the 1950s, it's mostly been a Mexican, Mexican-American community. And so it's got colorful street art around every corner, fantastic food, and uh, it's been attracting a lot of artists in recent years. Here's our riddle. Featuring Mexican art and culture, collections from both sides of the border, work by Aztecs and Rivera, you'll see museum admission is always free. It's the National Art Museum. I heard a couple, yes. <laughs> National Museum of Mexican Art. It was the first Latino museum accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. And it's one of the largest Mexican art collections in the country with over 18,000 pieces. And that spans all of history from ancient times all the way up to you know contemporary artists who are working today. And it's always free, as I said in the clue. So if I'm just in the neighborhood for an afternoon, I love to pop in and just see what's new. You know, you don't feel like you have to see the whole museum in one day because you're not paying for the admission. You can just go and see what's the new exhibit or, uh, you know, what's catching my eye this time. Um, they had a Frida Kahlo exhibit last year. It was fantastic. So they do a great job. And a beautiful gift shop. Don't miss that. All right. Heading to Lincoln Square, a charming neighborhood with German roots, with old world character and lots of modern boutiques and restaurants, bakeries. I like to say there's one student carrying an instrument case for every two strollers that you see. Here's our riddle. When you spot the owl, come on in. For budding musicians, it's a place to begin. Banjo and accordion are just two of the musical skills that they can teach you. Music. Correct. Old Town School. What's your name? Julie. Julie, thank you. Has anyone taken lessons at the Old Town School? <laughs> you have. What did you take? Years ago. Guitar. I always want to take guitar lessons there. I have a very dusty guitar that doesn't get played, um, but I keep writing books instead. 
<laughs> in my spare time. Maybe one day I'll I'll learn how to play an instrument. We're working with them to do a Joni Mitchell tribute program. Amazing. If anyone virtually couldn't hear that, there's going to be a Joni Mitchell tribute program coming up that uh, the library is working with the Old Town School. That's very cool. So the school was founded in the 1950s, and some of its alumni include musicians like John Prine and Steve Goodman, very illustrious. Uh, you'll see the owl on the building because this building used to be a library. Um, the library moved down the street to what is now the Seltzer Library. It's one of the big ones in the city. Um, so I love the little owls that are kind of around the building. And inside, there's, um, of course, the music school. There's a fabulous music store, and there's a concert hall. So I've been in there also just to see live music played. So check out their events calendar. It's a very nice space. Oh, Harry Carey. No. <laughs> Chinatown. Oh, uh, man. So I love going to Chinatown in the summer. We'll talk about about it, but uh, this is one of America's thriving Chinatowns uh, in Chicago. And it's the only, maybe, or maybe one of the few, but I think it's the only Chinatown um, in an urban city, an urban center in America that's growing. Most of them are kind of shrinking, getting pushed out a little bit, but our Chinatown is growing, which is very cool. And if you're there, you see streets lined with uh, decorative arches and pagodas, lots of traditional restaurants and souvenir shops. Um, it's a very like culturally rich, vibrant community. So there's uh, many different ethnicities represented from uh, Sichuan and Taiwanese to Can Cantonese and Mandarin. And here's our riddle. Marilyn, you're very close on your guess here. Named for a pillar of the community, there's four tall dragons that line the entry, stroll the bamboo grove and ginkgo trees, catching the water taxi is a breeze. This is Ping Tom Park. So Ping Tom was in this in this sculpture, he's commemorated. He was a prominent civic leader in the community and he helped get this park named because um, it's located right along the Chicago River. It was an old rail yard and it's now a 12 acre park. So amazing location here. Um, and the design of the park has Chinese elements like the columns I mentioned, you can see here have a dragon design that kind of wraps around them. Um, there's the, the ginkgo trees and there's also the pagoda that you see here, which is where you catch the water taxi. There's a few different water taxi locations around the city. Um, it's a fun way to go and visit Chinatown, take the water taxi, then on, um, or I'll ride my bike, but go and grab some food at a you know a local restaurant in Chinatown. And I bring it back and sit by the park here and watch the boats go by on the river. It's a lovely, lovely location. So um, summer is my favorite time to visit Pink Tom Park. They also have um, a boathouse. They do dragon boat races on the river. Usually, I think it's in June, usually June or July. Um, but there's a boathouse. You'll see folks, you know, rowing and things like that on the river. Just nice. Oh, Marilyn's husband has filmed many episodes of Chicago Fire, and he's mad he forgot the name of this park. Oh, they must have filmed here. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, Tommy Chong is somebody else. <laughs> so he's he is famous <laughs> for other things. All right. So we see when I were discussing this earlier, heading to Lakeview, which truly has something for everyone from the sports bars of Wrigleyville to the LGBTQ friendly nightclubs of North Halstead, um, which used to be called Boys Town. They've got theaters and lots of music venues and even touring the cemetery is fun. I enjoyed cemeteries. Graceland is in the book. Um, it's part of the Lakeview chapter because um, it's an arbor, ar arbor arboretum. Thank you. Uh, meaning it's got lots of beautiful trees and flowers, um, beautiful monuments as well. So I, I recommend checking it out. I'm trying to get people to visit in the book with uh, a few riddles that are in the cemetery, but this is just outside of the cemetery if that's not your thing. A colorful thunderbird spreading its wings 
is one of Chicago's more surprising things. A copy of a piece which once stood here, the original has been gone for many a year. Sorry? No. no, good, good guess. You know, I'll take it. It's kind of a And then um, weather wore it out and they tried to restore it and they kind of debased it. And then um, they found out it wasn't from the Haji Indians or whoever they thought it was from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So they, the park district donated it or donated it back to yeah. British Columbia, University of British Columbia. To, to the tribe or something yes. like that. And mm -hmm. um, Tony Hunt, who is a relative of George Hunt, who originally was connected mm -hmm. with this in the um, World Exposition, the Columbian Exposition, he did an exact replica and Kraft had commissioned it, Kraft Incorporated, and it's in Lincoln Park, right? It's Perfect summary, yes. <laughs> well, we used to pass that as kids in the car, mm -hmm. and I, we were involved. <laughs> this is an example of yeah one of those things that i when i moved here i would go on a bike ride or drive past on the highway on uh, lakeshore drive and wonder like what the heck is that totem pole doing here in chicago where'd that come from and it's an interesting story so for anyone who is um uh, uh, joining us remotely and wasn't able to hear um Stu, i'll just quickly summarize that it was uh the totem pole was purchased by the founder of Kraft Foods as a gift for the children of the city of Chicago in the 1920s, um, but it was returned to Canada to the, the tribe who created it in the 80s, and it was replaced with this copy. So this is an exact replica by Tony Hunt, um, who was the chief of the tribe, a Walgul tribe. Uh, it's 40 feet high, and it's made out of red cedar, and it's got a thunderbird grasping the tail of a, a whale. Um, riding the back of a sea monster. That's what's happening here. But uh, yeah, interesting backstory to this one. We're going to go to the far south side to the only national monument in Illinois. Uh, Pullman was a company town built in the 1880s uh, with on utopian ideals for the employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company. And it was very critical to U.S. labor history because those employees of the utopian town protested and went on strike against, against those ideals a few times. Um, There's a critical strike in 1894. And then in the 1920s, the Pullman Porters um, also went on strike and founded America's first African-American labor union. So as you walk the streets of Pullman, the community is, uh, the architecture is very well preserved. Um, you'll see brick homes that were built for the executives in the town and how those look. And then you'll see the houses for the newlyweds and then the houses for just the common laborers and how those all differ. You can kind of get that whole history walking around there. So it's a fascinating story. Here is our riddle. When visiting Pullman, here's where you start. This giant, this building was at the factory's heart. A giant clock shows where you can enter for info at the visitor center. Has anyone been to Pullman? Yes, 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 a few. Has anyone been on the house walk? Yes, I finally went a few years ago. Uh, one weekend a year in October, different residents of the community will open up their homes to visitors. And it's interesting because um, some of them have chosen to decorate their homes in, this, in the era of the building. So you'll see somebody with a lot of kind of Victorian vintage decor. And then some people are, you know, totally have modernized their space. It's interesting to get inside of those buildings and see what they look like on the inside. Um, so this one is the Administration Clock Tower Building. Uh, Marilyn's husband was guessing the South Shore Country Club. That's not this one, uh, but that is that is where the Obamas got married, the South Shore Country Club. So um, a different piece of history there. So this building was badly damaged by arson in the 1990s. Um, it was the administration building, of course, and it was renovated by the Park Service after um, Pullman became a national monument, and it was reopened uh, Labor Day 2021. So it's the new visitor center for the National Park 
So when you go and visit Pullman, this should be your first stop. You can go in, talk to the park rangers, see some exhibits on the history of the community um, and start your day in Pullman there. All right, just a couple more here. South Loop is another neighborhood that's got something for everyone, whether it's sports, um, conventions, entertainment, um, cultural attractions, and museums. And uh, the Rolling Stones, they have a song called 2120 South Michigan Avenue. Does anyone know what's at that address today? It's an instrumental song, so the lyrics won't help. So this is, oh, sorry, I didn't give you the, I didn't give you the clue. Rolling Stones named a song for this address. It was once the recording home of chess, featuring legends like Etta and Muddy, preserving Chicago's famed blues legacy. That clue might help. <laughs> uh, it is not Buddy Guys. That's a very good guess. So this is the Blues Heaven Foundation. Elaine's got it, chess records. So you'll see a uh, buddy guy's autograph guitar is inside. So that was a good guess. But um, in the 50s and 60s, this building was home to chess records. It was a legendary R&B label. And they produced hits like Johnny B. Good and Etta James's At Last in this building. And blues legend Willie Dixon was a musician here for many years. And he created this foundation to preserve the music's legacy and also to secure royalties for artists who did not always get their royalties during the day. Um, so you can tour the building to learn about Chicago's blues history. And uh, you can see the studio that Keith Richards called the perfect sound studio. It's still there. It's very cool to see. Um, and when I visited, there were people from all over the world. There are folks from the UK, from Hungary, from the Netherlands, uh, but I was the only Chicagoan there. So I think, I think more Chicagoans need to get out and uh, check out the Blues Legacy. Summertime is a great time to go because they you do typically do um, once a week a free show because they have this garden right next door. You can kind of see the gate to the garden here. Um, and I don't know, it used to be on Thursdays. You might want to check their their website or their Facebook page to make sure it's the right day and that they're still doing, still doing it. But as far as I know, it was um, Thursdays in the summer, free blues concert. So something fun to do. All right, just a couple more here. West Town is uh, the home of eclectic neighborhoods like Bucktown, Wicker Park and Ukrainian Village and a hub of creativity with lots of you know, cocktail bars, vintage stores, uh, record shops, things like that, live music venues. It's uh, where I live as well. So we're looking for Wicker Park's most acclaimed writer, which is not me, um, honored here with falling water. His words are spelled out on the ground, a Polonia triangle, it can be found. No, no, good guesses. We have so many famous writers in Chicago. Yes, is is Nelson Algren. So it's called Polonia Triangle here around this little intersection because there was the site of the Polish National Alliance and the site of the Polish Daily News. And Algren lived in the neighborhood. He often wrote about the down and out in Chicago, um, you know, more of the seedy side of the city. So some folks didn't like him for publicizing that. But the quote that's on the ground here is from uh, his work, Chicago City on the Make. And it says, for the masses who do the city's labor also keep the city's heart. You can kind of see that here. I like, I love that quote. And uh, his house is also in the book with a different riddle in the neighborhood. All right, one more for you here. Going to finish up in Lincoln Park. It's home to Chicago's largest park. Uh, of course, it's a beautiful historic neighborhood, easy to see why it's so popular with great lakefront access and lots of green space. And this is uh, a place that is both old and new. On the history trail, this hunk of stone formed from rock, molten iron and brick, the worst of disasters the city has known 
Proof of resilience lies in this relic. Chicago Fire? It's uh, something from the Chicago Fire, yes. I don't know if anyone has had a chance to see this. It's this giant hunk of junk. <laughs> this relic from the Chicago Fire. This was found on the site of an iron warehouse. So during the fire, the iron melted down into the brick and the stone of the building that it was in formed this blob. Um, so it, this used to be hidden. This is, this is located next to the History Museum. It used to be hidden in a bush behind the museum. So I kind of enjoy that as a person who likes kind of hidden secret things because you had to go to the plaza behind the museum and go stand on a bench and peek over into the bushes down to see this thing, which is a relic from the fire. I kind of enjoy that, but this is much better now. It is on display and um, it's something that you can touch. You can, it's front and center. You can go up and touch a piece of history. There's little like coins and things embedded into it. It's kind of fun to check out. But it's all part of the new history trail, I believe that opened in 2021, next to the History Museum, which the museum is fabulous, but you do have to pay admission. Here's a little free thing that you can go enjoy and do. And they have um, it's a little walking path with, uh, there's a section on indigenous people, uh, native plants, things like that. There's um, a row of sculptures that represent all the different um community centers and each center voted on how they wanted to be symbolized in the sculpture. It's pretty neat. So a fun thing to go check out in the summertime. If you're in the city, um, enjoying Lincoln park or the beach or the, the green city farmers market over here, um, stop by and enjoy the history trail and you can touch this piece of the Chicago fire. So we just covered one place from each, uh, neighborhood in the book. There's about 20 ish per neighborhood. So lots more to check out. And here's my website if you're interested. Um, of course, the library does have both of my books, as Jamie said. Um, you can find it at other stores as well. Um, on my website, I have a little discount if you'd like to order it there. I have some up here, but thank you all for coming. And um, I would love to hear your questions and your favorite hidden gems in Chicagoland. Any favorite spots, hidden locations, weird history? The duck in. in Bridgeport, I have. I have. I just went to a wedding there. Yes, it was. The food was delicious. Yeah, Kevin Hickey is the. Oh, I love the architectural tours. Um, are you talking about the boat tours or just the walking tours or everything? All of them. Yes. Yes. They are fabulous. Maybe someday I can be a docent. That would be amazing. I, they're just so knowledgeable. And it's quite a rigorous program to become a Chicago Architecture Foundation docent. I know a few folks who've done it. I admire them so much. And of course, the boat tour is one of my favorite things to do in the summer. I do it every year, um, at least once. And I always learn something new. And of course, the skyline's always changing downtown. So it's always something different to look at. Love that Jeffrey Baird did a little. Uh, he did. <laughs> he did. Yeah, there's a little blurb on the back of my book from Jeffrey Bear. Thank you. Yes, it was very kind of him to do. He was very generous with his time um, to take time out and and do that. Of course, he's very busy. Um, I really appreciated it because I'm a huge fan of his work, being a Chicago history nerd. Uh, Karen Singh, I love driving around McCormick Boulevard to see the sculptures. Fabulous. Very nice. Alan, like Rose Hill Cemetery. Rose Hill Cemetery. Okay. I did go in and see the, um, there's a shed chapel in the mausoleum. Yeah, it's the shed family and there's like stained glass. It's very pretty. Um, and lots of like deer and animals in the cemetery as well. So Here's the story, the back story I heard. Oh, please, that, yes. Um, it's now called Rose Hill, R-O-S-E-H-I-L-L, -L, mm -hmm. but it was it originally intended, it was owned by a farmer, but with the last name of Roe, R-O-E, and it was Rose Hill. Ah. Words, and then it, it, it somehow the, the, it got registered wrong in the, in the city. Um, oh, yeah. Fantastic. 
<laughs> if you didn't hear that, it was Rose Hill Cemetery was originally R-O-E, Rose Hill, and then it got kind of smushed together there. Yeah, so you also enjoy walking around cemeteries. So here's another story. One Sunday afternoon, we were coming back from the from um, Midsummer Fest in, mm. in Andersonville, mm -hmm. and I was with a, we were with friends who wanted uh, this friend of mine who said her father is buried in Rose Hill, and so she wanted to drive in and just you know say a quick hi to Dad, oh. and um, so we did, and it was about four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and we drove in, and then we decided to park and walk around for a while because uh, all of the headstones are just so beautiful there, and then we got back in the car and went to leave, and. The gate was locked. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Did you spend the night in the cemetery? I have to, but um turns out that if you drive around there is another oh my goodness. So sorry, it's not an exciting end of the story. Oh but, well, uh, I'm sure that was an exciting feeling to think that you were going to be in the cemetery overnight. Five o'clock point, nobody told us. You know, so. Oh my goodness. Well, that would be a unique Chicago experience. <laughs> I was born in Rogers Park, and there's mm -hmm. a cemetery there. I don't know the name of it. Okay. But I said to my mom, well, you used to always take me to this beautiful park. Or to, yes, we, there were swans. There were willow trees. Yes, I remember that. I was in a stroll. No, never. Oh, that was the cemetery. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we've been exploring cemeteries forever. I mean, they're they're beautiful quiet peaceful usually not too crowded so <laughs> great for social distancing and uh yeah getting out and enjoying i did go during the pandemic on my birthday when you know in 2020 i was like let's go to the cemetery it's beautiful i can <laughs> you just sit and enjoy the pond and the trees and things and um there were a lot of birders there it makes sense with all the trees but i didn't realize that well, thank you all for sharing. Thank you for coming out tonight and joining me on this lovely summer evening. And thank you, Jamie and Deerfield Library for having me back. Thank you. Appreciate it.